So let's grab our Bibles. You can sit down and you can stand to say our Bible confession. This is our Bible. This is God speaking to us. Our eyes are open. Our hearts are prepared to receive all of God's promises and instructions. Today we make our Bible the final authority in our life so that in every circumstance we will bear good fruit and others will see Christ in us in Jesus' name. And Father God, I ask you to continue to allow the Holy Spirit to work in this church through me and everyone else here. Amen. Part two, 10-week series called The Rooted, connected to God, the church, and our purpose. The purpose of this Rooted series is to deepen our relationship and connection to God, the church, and our purpose. And I hope you're being blessed by it. But most importantly, when you finish the series, I hope that you live, as I said last week, passionately and purposely for our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I hope you're prepared. So chapter two, who is God? For some of us, God is who we call in the time of trouble. To some of us, God is the creator of the universe. Some of us, God is larger than life. He's this cosmic being. And some of us just don't simply believe that he exists or that he is God. Whatever it may be, whatever it is, God is, whatever you believe, God is or isn't, our thoughts have been, our thoughts in our mind has been shaped around who God is by church, by our family, by culture, and some of us in our own ideas. But do we really know who God is? One thing's for sure is that none of us can, ima can, can craft up images or words to adequately describe who God is. We can use all the descriptive words in the dictionary and we will still fall short of describing God and the magnitude of who he is. Christian author who is in the book I'm going to quote, he says, God does not come to us in nicely defined, rationally explained thought categories. God does not fit himself into our theological textbooks. God breaks all rules. He is near, yet transcendent, clothed in human form, yet holy, more terrifying than we can imagine, yet compassionate, invisible, revealed, judging, yet merciful, sovereign, yet humble. No matter where you look, God breaks the mold. He is everywhere at every place at the same time. This quote reminded me and echoes Isaiah 55. If you would, please turn there, and it'll be on your screen if you need it. It says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. And read this scripture as if it's talking directly to you. So, Andre, your thoughts are nothing like my thoughts, God says, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine, could imagine, can imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than earth, the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I love this next verse. It's one of my favorite verses. In Romans 11, I'm reading from the, the uh, Passion Translation. 11, 33 to 36, follow me. Who could ever wrap their minds around the riches of God, the depth of his wisdom, the marvel of his perfect knowledge, who could ever explain the wonder of his decisions or search out the mysteries, mysterious, mysterious way he carries out his plan? For who has discovered how the Lord thinks or is wise enough to be the one to advise him in his plans? How dare us? Who has ever first given something to God that obligates God to owe him something in return? He owes us nothing, yet he sacrificed his son for us. And because God is the source and sustainer of everything, say everything, everything. finds fulfillment in him. May all praise and honor be him, given to him forever, forever, and ever. Amen. So he's saying his thoughts, and his, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. We don't know why he does what he does when he decides to do what he does, how he orchestrates the things he does in our life. We're just amazed at it. We know or at least we can assume he loves us and he wants the best for us, but still we don't know God and how powerful he is. 
this is not to belittle us, but we don't have the capacity to fathom the death and the breath of our God. The smartest person in the world can't figure out God. The scientists can't figure out God. We only know what he wants us to know, and apparently it's not that much. The bottom line is we're never going to know, our thinking is never going to be complete until the complete returns. And even then, we still won't know. God will reveal himself when he wants to. Amen? And it is only when he reveals himself to us we begin to know him, have a relationship with him, and learn to love him. So who is God? He reveals himself in three ways. Write the first one down. Because why? It'll save your life. <laughs> Number one, through his creation. Number two, through his son, Jesus Christ. And number three, the Holy Scriptures. So let's talk about his creation. God is everywhere. Just take a step outside. And if you would, turn to the left or turn to the right of your neighbor. Will you please indulge me? Turn to the left or right to see your neighbor. That's the creation he created. Amen? Look at the mountains. He's in the mountains. The beaches, the jungles, ocean depths, prairies, farmland, deserts, valleys, even in the people right next to you or in front of you. We are all his creation, all shapes, sizes, and colors. Psalms 139, 14 says, we are so wonderfully complex. We are complex. We are confusing. We are unique. And he made us. All the emotions that you can never have comes from above. And he made us. To see God's creation is to see a piece of him. We are a piece of God's work. Romans 1.20 says, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. You can look right in front of you and say, you can say you don't know God. Well, yes, you do. Look at the person in front of you. You know God. Translation, the Passion Translation says, opposition to the truth cannot be excused on basis of ignorance. Because from the creation of the world, the invisible qualities of God's nature have been made visible. Such as his eternal power and transcendence. He has made his wonderful attributes easily perceived for seeing the visible makes, uh, makes us understand the invisible. So then this leaves everyone without excuse. So today onward, none of you all have excuses to not believe that God doesn't exist, including me. To see God's creations is to see him. Not that we are God's, but God in us. We may not understand why God does what he does, but for those who have been around for a while and have experienced him, we know he exists. Amen. Where you were and where, look where you were and look where you are now. Whether you are 50, 60, 70 and above or 30, we may not understand why God does what he does, as I said already, because we couldn't do it the way God can. Anybody here can do what God can do? No, we cannot. To know God is to understand the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is the central part of our Christian faith. Not three, not three people. That's three in one. I'll explain. It's the belief that the one has disclosed himself eternally as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The one. It's not the belief of three, God, th of three gods or of one God in three different modes, functions, and operations. It's the one. God is three internal distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who live eternally in loving community as one. Amen. For some of you, when Pastor Ray was here through Radiant Church, he put up an X, and then he had a circle with a bunch of Xs in there. That was all God. God is one. He's three in one, one in three. He's eternal. Let's turn to Genesis 1, verses 1 and 3, which captures this completely. 
and will also differentiate the, the, between God the Spirit and, and God, the Spirit of God, God's word distinctly in Genesis. It says, in the beginning, God prepared, formed, and fashioned, created the heavens and earth. The earth was without form and an empty waste, and darkness was upon the face of, very, of the very great deep. The Spirit of God was moving, hovering over the face of the earth, excuse me, waters. And God said, he spoke, let there be light, and there was light. The one God created, creating, moving, and speaking as one. He just proved that he is three in one. The second way God reveals himself is through his son, Jesus Christ. Let's go to John 1, verse 1 through 14. Follow me on this. You with me? Yeah. Amen. It says, in the beginning, before all time, the word, Jesus, and the word was with God. And the word, Jesus, was God himself. Verse 2, Jesus was present originally with God. All things, not some, but all things were made and came into existence through him. And without him was not even one thing made that has come into being. Plain and simple. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. You can even call Jesus the light. The light, Jesus, shines in the darkness. For the darkness has never overpowered it. Meaning there is no darkness, no such a dark place that the light of Jesus cannot eliminate, illuminate. Through, in and through. Verse 6, there came a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came to witness that he might testify of the light, Jesus, that all men might believe in it, adhere to, trust, and rely upon it through him, Jesus Christ. Verse 8, he was not the light himself, but came that he might bear witness regarding the light that he represents. There, there it was, the true light coming into the world, the genuine, perfect, steadfast light that illuminates every person. Verse 10, he came into the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him, did not know him. Verse 11, he came to, to that which belonged to him, and they came and they who, they who were his own did not receive him and did not welcome him. That alone is a whole um, uh, sermon right there. But to as many as did not receive and welcome him, he gave them authority, power, privilege, right to become the children of God. In other words, you don't have to believe me now. You're going to believe me, and I give you the power to receive me and accept me and become my child. Again, choice. That is to those who believe in, trust, and rely on him, Jesus. Jump down to verse 14. And the word, Jesus, became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we saw his glory, such glory as only begotten Son receives from his Father, full of grace and truth. So again, three and one, one and three. You see, John's account of God revealing himself was through the word. John opens up with the astounding claim, in the beginning was the word, and the word was the was with God and the word was God. Notice the word is eternal. Before the beginning began, he already was. He already was. The word, the word is personal. He was God. He was with God, was part of God himself. This word, eternal self-communication of God, became flesh, and he walked among us. The word in Genesis is none other than one that we know as Jesus Christ. So I went a little further. Kimberly asked me today, she said, baby, you got all these books? I said, yeah, that's what God's given me. <laughs> I got all these books. So I was doing my studies, and let me read this to you. It says, God had no beginning. It's talking about the beginning of the world. When God began to create the heavens and earth, that avoids giving the impression that Genesis is talking about the absolute beginning. It doesn't pretend to know what God was doing before the beginning of the world. All right, so the word of Genesis in John 1, we know he's referring to Jesus Christ. So we'll move on. So the third way God reveals himself. So we know first it is through this, uh, first it was through his creation, second it was through Jesus Christ, and third is through his word. Turn with me to 2 Timothy 3.16 to 17. 
It's a very familiar scripture here. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work to fulfill any assignment God has given us. So the Bible is the truth, the way, and the life. It is an instruction manual on how we as God's people and his children are to live. Scripture is God's revelation to himself, to us. Scripture is God's revelation of himself to us, his plan of redemption for us, and how he is going to accomplish it through his son, Jesus Christ. We may not fully understand it or comprehend it, all aspects of God. But as we, as with anything, if we search for greater knowledge, we're going to get greater knowledge. We're not to be where we are. We're to continue to move and grow. We'll never really know who God is, but we'll get closer to who he is if we continue to study his word. Amen? So in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. So through him, all things were made, including us. I said that before, including us. And we are good. God is good. Only. All the time. Genesis 1. Let's talk about his creation again for a moment and how good it is. And how many times he said good. And he left us to take care of one another in this earth because it is good. If I give you something that is good, it's good. You are to appreciate it. You're to govern it. You're to be a good steward of it. Amen? Amen. Because your love for me is why you're going to treat it well. You're going to take care of it. You may not like it, but because your love for me, you will accept it. Amen? Genesis 1, 24, 25. Then God said, let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and wild animals. And that is what happened. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock and small animals, able, each able to produce offspring of the same kind, and God saw that it was good. So then wild cats and dogs we don't like, they're still good. God made them. Ain't that right, Pastor Ron? Genesis 1, then God said, let us make human beings in our image. I always wonder, what, who is God talking to? Us and our. So, of course, you have to study the word out. There's answers out there. It says, why does the Bible say, let us make human beings in our own image? I explained it to you. It's all in the word. You don't have to go very far. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image. Whose image? Our image. The one God in three. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To be like us. Three distinctive attributes acting as one. To me, that's amazing. They will reign over, they will reign over the fish in this area, in the sea, the birds in the sky and livestock, and the livestock, excuse me, all the wild animals on earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image, in his own image, three in one. You see how it goes back and forth? In the image of God, he created the man and the one man. Everything about God's creation was what? Good. How many know that God is good? He means good. He does good only all the time. God, always, God is not only good, he's a good God. There was no conflict during this time. There was no destruction during this time. There was no disease during this time. There was no bickering during this time. There wasn't the Republicans, the Democrats, pollutions, COVID-19. Everything was in the way God intended it to be, which was good. Everything else we created, which is not good. And what he intended it for you and me was his creation to have a unique relationship with him. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We were made in his image, which means that we are things true of God that are also true in us. Follow me. While obviously we are not God, I mean, we do reflect one of his certain characters. And one of those characters that we share is we were made for cooperative participation with him. He cooperates with us, does he not? He answers our prayers. I would say that's cooperation. But you ask anyone, do we cooperate with him? We don't. Not all the time. And when we do, it's half. 
is half cocked. I won't say that other word. Y'all know what I'm referring to. But it's half. It's half. When's the last time you gave somebody, when's the last time I said, somebody said they liked what you gave them? It was at half. I want it all. He wants it all. We were made to be in conjunction with him and his work. His work. Take care of what I give you, God. Y'all, be good stewards of it. We were made to work with him, not against him. Why are we always working against God, Andre? I don't know. Why are you? Why you don't cooperate? Why you don't love? Why you don't walk and talk the way I've showed you? I don't know. That's that flesh. We were made to have children, to feel, subdue, and rule the earth. Most importantly, take care of the earth. You may not understand global warming and the environment, and we tend to get caught up in all these political packs. This is a distraction. I saw someone the other day litter. I said to myself, I said, litter is like dated. Remember back in the day, at least where I grew up, and when I was growing up, littering was kind of cool. I mean, it didn't make sense. You shouldn't do it. You know your parents tell you. But literally, it's like, you know, you got a cigarette, you got some candy, just throw it out. It's cool. But literally, it's so dated. It's old. It's like, I mean, why are you still doing that? Like, pick it up. Pick up the mask. Pick up the trash. Pick up your cigarette. The trash container's right over there. Why do you think they put trash containers everywhere? It's so dated. Take care of the earth, he says. You can read that in Genesis. He made us to be creators and to be good stewards over what he gave us. To be good stewards over your car, if you have one, over your health, over your home, over your wife, over your husband, over your friend. If he's given it to you, then we're to take care of it. What I realized during the study is that the global warning and things about the environment matter to God, and they should matter to us. Doesn't necessarily you mean you have to get involved in an a, 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 a environment program or organization, but you can at least keep the ground, you know, don't litter, do certain things, do some study, do some research on what we can do in today's time to help better the earth, treat the plants, water your plants if you have plants. You know, there's things we can do. Amen? To know God, to know that God created us, shows us that he loves us and cre created us for a purpose. So we are to definitely take care of what he has given us, and which is in this incredible world. So I was watching a movie uh, yesterday, or day before yesterday, and in this movie it said that, um, it was actually filmed in New Orleans, and it said this is a dirty city. But he said there's so much opportunity there. Well, dirty city, dirty lakes, he referred to, despite the dirty water and pollution in the air, this is, quote, in this city, this city is still beautiful. I'll tell you what I mean. He says, look at this. What a great opportunity for us to do right by God. You see something dirty, you should clean it. You know, I, I'm at work and I see a penny on the ground. First, I got my conspiracy mind going on. Like, if I pick up this penny, are they testing me? They got the cameras at me? They going to, and I'm thinking, okay, sh shut up, Andre. Shut up, Andre. You're getting spooky. You know, you, you, you walk past something, it's like... Like I told you about that highlighter, I saw a penny on the ground, I was like, this is a test. They tested me. They want to see if I'm going to be good, a good steward over their money. So I pick up the penny. Sometimes I don't even pick up the penny. I'm going to keep it real with you. I stay in that conspiracy theory mindset. But then I pick up the penny and I just do this. I don't know. I'm just saying. But anyway, watching this movie, it just got me thinking that what a great opportunity. I haven't seen my brother. My, my brother was born excuse me, my brother grew up with my grandmother, and um, I grew up with my mother. And my brother and I are, are tremendously different, plus there's so many ages between us. And um, I told him one day, you know, I said, I, 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 hope you, I, wanna, I hope you forgive me for the way I treated you, because I've forgiven you. But I said, most importantly, this time that we've not been able to look, uh, to be together, I look at it as an opportunity for us to learn, to get to know each other better. So yeah, I flipped it. I could take that opportunity and stay on our differences, but I took the opportunity and the space and our opportunity to say, hey, look how much we have to make up. I'm going to pursue that much time. I mean, I get it all, but I'm going to do my best to rectify and reconcile our relationship. Amen? So getting back to what I was saying, is it's a great opportunity to take this incredible world that God has given us and turn things around, make it look better, make it love better. We can go on with the list of things God has given you an opportunity to do that you have every day. 
to do at work, at home, with people. You can turn negative situations into positive situations. There was someone speaking to my daughter the other day, and she just let her vent, and my daughter says, now you feel good about it? <laughs> like, okay, just, you feel good about all these negative things you were saying. What an opportunity. But some of the, somewhere along the way, we went wrong. Sin's powerful, destructive force entered our world. It damaged us, our lives, our relationships, the world, and our relationship, most importantly, with God. It all started with Adam and Eve. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole story of Adam and Eve, and you already know it, but I am going to read this caption here. It says, now I'm going to tell you about Adam and Eve. We know the story. The serpent deceived Eve. She ate from the tree she wasn't supposed to eat from, gave it to her man, her husband, Adam. He ate it also, blamed her. She blamed the serpent. Bam, the powerful destruction of sin entered. I'm going to get funny on you. You know how I feel about the word naked. See, you guys, when, when, I'm, when I'm not here anymore, y'all going to laugh at me. But you know when I say naked. Now, this is off, off the cuff here, but Adam and Eve were naked. We all know that. But when they did something they weren't supposed to do, and played along in the destruction of uh, introducing sin, they were butt naked. That means they were exposed. They weren't exposed before. So to see a man and a woman naked was nothing. They didn't think anything about that. But when they got exposed to the knowledge that they weren't supposed to get exposed to, they act like God when he said don't, and they did, they got butt naked where they started to see each other for really the way they shouldn't have seen each other in the beginning. You go over to Europe, their papers are filled with naked women in the, in the daily newspapers. Not all Europe. I lived in Japan for two years, and they have naked women at the end of the box. That doesn't bother them. I was like, ooh, like, how can you be doing it? Now, check this out. I said, ooh, how can you be doing that in a bus station with the public? But there I am looking at pornography back in the States. It don't make no sense. But they, it's blatant to them. But they didn't, they didn't know until they knew. So sometimes we ain't supposed to know everything. Some things are just going to be mysterious to us. You know, they said they have UFOs. Well, great. I don't have time to be dealing with UFOs right now. I got to go to work. I got to get up and take my medicine, see if I'm going to operate well. You know, pray to God. I move so I can help a client. Pastor Lori said if there's UFOs, praise God. We'll probably never see it in our lifetime, so why worry about it? Adam and Eve had a choice, and, we'll, and we all know the choice they made because of the choice they made. There are consequences, and we are now paying for it, just like our words. We spew out words, they have consequences. The consequences are corru corruption, war, hate, disease, selfishness, greed, deceit, rape, murder, theft, Shame, fear, guilt, lying, stealing, cheating. Whew. Every relationship we once had or they had was damaged. Instead of intimacy with God, there is fear and hiding. Instead of intimacy with God between man and woman, there is shame and a power struggle. Every creation groans and groaning under the weight of their disobedience. Now that's where I get the book. Listen to this. Our thinking, we don't think this depth, and y'all still follow me, we're still on good on time. I'm gonna read this to you. This is the way God intended things to go, operated, and we jacked them up. It says both man and woman, female and ma male and female, belong to the image of God. You have the image of God representing humanity only when you have both men and women together. When men and women, when women are not present and involved in God's work in the world and in the church, the image of God is not present. The Bible talks about us being joint heirs. Further, however, we understand the difference between men and women, the physical difference between them is a sign that this distinction is the elemental marker of diversity in humanity. It is as, it as, it is as creator, creators, cr cr creatures made jointly in, in God's image that women and men together have a task of mastering the earth. So men, we can't do it by ourselves. God is the ultimate authority. 
God then delegates authority over crea to, to creation for humanity. And men and women together are the means of exercising it. Women, y'all can't do it to get all alone. There is no suggestion in the creation stories that God designed the world to be a place where any human being exercised authority over any others. Whoo, that's cold. Read it again, Andre. There is no suggestion in creation that God designed the world to be a place where any human being, black or white, et cetera, et cetera, being exercised authority over another. There was no authority to be exercised by men or women or husbands or wives over wives. There were no masters and servants or slaves. There were no kings and subjects, and there were no emperors and un un underlings. As Bob Dylan put it, gates of Eden, there are gates of Eden. There are no kings inside the gates of Eden. We all, we all were one in his creation. Perhaps that is only, perhaps the reason that Genesis mentions humanity being male and female is that it's only their sexual comp complementary sexual attributes that makes it possible for men and women to reproduce and fill the earth, as well as exercise authority over it. A key way that women are involved in filling and holding sway over the world for God with men is by bearing children. Neither men or their own, neither men or women on their own can bear children. Should be able to fill the earth and exercise authority over it. But the, this is the last part. But the point about the Bible is to confront us, not to just confirm. What do we read in 2 Timothy? Not just to confirm what we think we already know. And one important feature of the creation story is the high estimate God places on motherhood. God did not make every woman capable of having children. Apparently, God doesn't reckon that a woman is somewhat, somehow less human if she isn't a mother. There are other ways of being fruitful, of making your contribution to, to the flourishing of the world. You mean there's other ways? Yes. God said it. Genesis is talking about humanity as a whole, not about how things work out every cup, for every couple. But Western culture came to separate the world of work, of work from the world of home and to imply that the world is the, the to imply that the world of work is more important and thus devalue motherhood y'all percolate on that romans 8 20 to 22 says for against its for against its will the universe itself had no had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin but now the eager expectation all creation longs for freedom from its slavery of decay to experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God's children. To this day, we are aware of the universal agony, the universal agony, groaning of creation. The world is groaning, y'all, as if it were in the contra contractions of labor for childbirth, all because of Adam and Eve. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Remember, that's not necessarily physical. It could be your job. It could be medical insurance. It could be your money, your reputation, your respect, your honor, or your life. Sometimes this death is a byproduct of our sinful choices, the result of someone else's choice of just living in a corrupt, tainted world. Often it's a combination of all three, but what is certain, we all experience deadly deadly consequences of our sin. You think, you know, when you, we commit a sin, you know, God's just going, you know, it, we're just going to die. But you realize your relationship ain't going right and all these other areas are not going right because you didn't repent. You didn't recognize what you did. You didn't ask for reconciliation and to restore it from God. And you wonder why things are going wrong in our world and in your life. The Bible is very clear about this fact that if we don't deal with the sin head up, we will continue to be separated from God, both now and eternity. So he's saying you have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to clean our stuff up now to guarantee, hopefully guarantee, hopefully guarantee our way into heaven. The good news, it ain't over yet. This is not the end of the story. There is a redeemer and he is Jesus Christ.
He came to be the mediator. God himself came down to the world as Jesus to begin the process to reverse what we messed up, to reverse, to be the, to be the go-between. Jesus is the one we go to when we are in trouble. He took it upon himself to take our sin and its consequences and put it on his back and lay it up on the cross for us to be restored. I mean, that's, if you just visualize all that, that's kind of like, it's like somebody really loved us to do just that. Romans 5, 6 through 11. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. <laughs> of course not. Though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. What do they need to die for? You're good. You're a good person. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Jesus Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So our Redeemer made it clear that the path back to God was open to everyone, regardless of race, creed, color, gender, heritage, religious dedication, guilt, shame, accomplishment, or any other human measurement. He made it available to all of us. Salvation through Jesus is a gift offered to, uh, to God for us. And it's the gift we must eventually re individually receive. You can't depend on anyone else. You cannot depend on anyone else but yourself. So I was thinking at the end there, because I'm ending now, it says the steps in the book say the ABCs of getting saved. Um, and I'm only going to be a few more minutes here, but I, as I was reading it, the Spirit was telling me that um, I know it's a book and we're going through the study, but not everything is ABC. You know the story how my brother died. He got shot. He fell down the steps. And I believe that he was saved somewhere during that time and come to find out he was already saved. He accepted the Lord in his life. So it's not always an ABC thing because I don't believe my, my, my brother knew to say that I'm a, admit that he was a sinner, repent of him being of his sins and believing all about Jesus because he didn't, he didn't learn about Jesus. He never went to church. So in my studies and in, 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 in things that Timberly and I have been through, I don't necessarily think, we always come with these one, two, three steps, four, five, six, ten steps, nine steps. Magazines have come out with headings, you know, ten steps to look beautiful. You know, 15, 125 steps to walk, which starts with the first walk, you know, first step. And I, and I have respect for what it is here, but my thing is, based on what I've learned in study, so this is not a personal thing, and please don't misunderstand, is that God's going to come to you when he's going to come to you. Because you, what we're fighting against right now is people don't believe this. You know, Acts 2 talk about what they did. But as I was reading further in Acts, Jesus, Paul had to fight to prove to people that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life, that one, only one Messiah. So that's what we're dealing with today. We're fighting to convince people uh, based, on our act, based on our words to just believe God and Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. But a lot of people don't go for that today. They want to see life done in your life. They want to see with the example that you're living, what you're walking out. So, yeah, I can go over these ABCs because we know that what? It says admit that you're a sinner, believe in Jesus Christ and what he did, and be committed to him. You're going to be committed to Jesus Christ when it's time for you to be committed. When you are down and out, when you ain't got nowhere else to go, but up or further down, you're going to be committed to getting out of that because Jesus Christ saved your life. So I, don't, I agree totally with the ABCs and with Romans walk, the Romans walk, and I don't know all the Romans walk, but I also believe that God's going to come to you and get you when he needs you, when he wants you, when you're calling out to him. It's not a one, two, three step. So when you go to these auditoriums, and this is just your pastor right here, the little old me, when you go to these 50,000 arenas and they say they saved everybody, I don't know about that. 
I'm not questioning it. I'm not saying it isn't true. But where do these 50,000 people go after the next day? How are they staying in contact with them? Maybe they did it out of root, routine, because everybody else did it. Well, you know, my, my, my wife brought me here, so let me just go in, you know, in the name of, you know, I forgive me my sin. I'm saved. Oh, hallelujah. And I didn't even say it completely. So that's the hard thing. So you can read that in the book, but what I believe and what God has been telling me and, and mine is that people are going to come to Jesus when Jesus, comes, when, when Jesus is introduced to them by one of us. He's also going to come to Jesus. They're going to come to Jesus when they are down and out. Because when you're down and out, as I said before, ain't no way to go but up. So I know all that. I think everybody here is a believer, and I'm going to end it like that. Because I think you have to, you have, we have to begin to show people that, you know, it's, it's no longer about talking about the blood and how he covered us. We're going to talk about the scars, of the, how, we got, how we got scarred up and how I come out of this, how I have Parkinson's, but how I keep pushing forward, how my wife has rheumatoid arthritis, but she keeps pushing forward, how Pastor Lori was sitting up on stage in uh, crutches sometimes in a wheelchair, and how she pushed through it. Because now you want to know, how is she doing that? Well, let me tell you about the God I serve. Let me tell you about the son he gave me when I was down and out, when I was broken, when I was broke physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. We, remember we talked about... Um, relationships, broken relationships being mended. That's what we need to do, start mending some of these relationships that people, they look at the younger generation, the millennials. They don't want, they're tired of hearing our mouth. They want to see some action. They want to see some transparency. They want to see your pastor boo-hoo and come back the next day, next week and go, you know what? My shame is on the cross. How did I do it? When I was alone in the war room, when I'm praying. When my wife wasn't there, the kids weren't there, and I'm looking at God and reflecting my life, where I was and where I am now. That's what saved me. That's when I'm going to come to Jesus Christ. That's when I'm going to be committed. That's when I'm going to admit that I'm a sinner and then follow you. You look at some of the pictures back in the day with Jesus. I wouldn't follow him if I had sense. The physical, you know, the, the picture. Because that's really all we have back in the day, especially black folks. You always saw that. Don't get me wrong, but you always saw that, that white Jesus up there. It's like, he don't look nothing like me, mama. 